Hello, I'm Neil Gaiman. Um, I'm here because they put two chairs <laughs> and a small table between them up here and uh, told me I was going to get to sit in one of the chairs. And on a night like this, you sort of figure that you need somebody in the other chair. So possibly Margaret Atwood might be willing to come up from the audience and join me. <laughs> if only everything in life were that easy. <laughs> ah, so, um, I thought I'd embarrass you first of all by talking about how we first encountered each other, which was, um, you didn't know it actually, because I actually first encountered you by reading your books, um, but you were not aware of this. Um, Maybe I was, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's terrifying. <laughs> Just the idea that you're looking out through your books at people. That would be a, Why don't we do that more? Yes, I saw you reading my book, and I saw what you did. Um, <laughs> But it was, it was 2005, and you had just announced the long pen, and I, on my blog, with my tongue firmly in my cheek, explained that I thought a remote-controlled signing device would be just about as welcome in the world as a remote-controlled kissing device. <laughs> and, um, and the Globe and Mail, asked you about this. And all I remember was you said something so unutterably nice, rather than rising to the bait. Um, you just made a very nice comment about sometimes you do need to be kissed remotely, and what if you're living in Tibet? And, um, <laughs> and anyway, I think Neil Gaiman is a very cute author, or something like that. <laughs> At which point, it was like, oh, you won. You just completely won that one. Um, it wasn't even a battle, and you won it, and now I am yours. And the next thing, when you approached me to do um, a long pen signing, my immediate thing was, yes, absolutely, I'm there. <laughs> you said I was cute in the Globe and Mail. You were very cute. So, so that they was how... They have now invented the long-distance kissing device. <laughs> have you seen that? It looks like this sort of egg thing. Have you seen it? Sort of this big, sort of plastic mouth. <laughs> you, you kiss. You, so you, you attach it at one end to your mouth? I'm, I haven't tried it myself. <laughs> but apparently you and the person that you wish to remotely kiss uh, each have these sort of plastic sets of lips. And you apply yours to your one on your end, and they apply theirs to the one on their end. And I suggest you close your eyes while doing this. <laughs> and These visions of those old to... wax lips that we used to get as kids. Only bigger and squishier. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they have done it. Yes, yeah, so you, if, if you can think about it, somebody is probably working on it right now. And considering that I just said that to you, that's a bit terrifying. <laughs> Which means that you had not yet thought about doing the hookup of the long pen remote controlled kissing device in sort of in tandem, so that you could not well, only actually, sign for somebody we, but give them a peck on the cheek as they We need. actually had thought of it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we hadn't patented it. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of other things going on in that department that we won't go into here. 
Um, as I said, if you can think of it, there's somebody working on it right now. Um, as for the long pen, it is now happily engaged. We assume it's happy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happily engaged in the business, uh, banking, and governmental worlds. Um, and it is now things have come full circle. So maybe two, three years ago or four years ago, people were saying everything's going to be digital. Now it turns out that that's not true. Everything is not going to be digital. We saw ebooks go up, and then we saw them come back down, and it seems that hardback books are alive and well. So maybe have, <laughs> there are um, yeah, neurological reasons for that, as we now have been told, that uh, it's easy to read newspapers on your tablet, but it's kind of hard to read War and Peace. <laughs> sort of hard to orient yourself in it. It's, it's weird. You lose that ability to go, I'm about this far through the book, and I was there on the page. Well, or, um, and, and I know sort of spatially yeah. where Natasha was, uh, you know, three months ago, like that. You, you, it's hard. They're easy to search for um, single words and phrases, but hard to keep track of time in them, or so I and others find. Anyway, that seems to be what has happened. So who can tell? Having been told that the long pen was obsolete, we're now being told that actually it's not. <laughs> what was the, what, I, I have to ask, I don't think I've ever asked you, what was the initial moment? Of doing that, it? Of doing it. Well, the initial moment was 2004, and there, at that point there were no e-books, there were no touch screens on your phone, and there were no tablets. Uh, there were books, and there were book tours that only ever took authors to uh, big cities. So there were a ton of people out there who didn't live in big cities who never got to meet the author uh, or have a book signed unless they drove thousands of miles. Uh, now, we're not talking about England, which is relatively compact, but North America... Still takes you weeks if you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> takes you weeks to get from London to Bath. Exactly. <laughs> Yes, well, it takes me weeks, but that's different. <laughs> um, yes, North America is large, and in Canada, the unofficial national anthem is a song called Canada's Really Big. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it on YouTube. It's by a group called the Arrogant Worms, and it goes into all the things that other countries have, uh, but what Canada has instead is Canada's really big. So we, uh, that was always a bit of an impediment uh, when you were talking about books, because they had to get to these places that were quite far apart. Yeah. And it's true in, in America as well. You know, getting the books to the place, getting the author to the place, getting here and there. Uh, we now have the internet, which allows Skyping sometimes. <laughs> it allows sometimes a clear picture of the other person and sometimes a kind of Picasso impression. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that moment where everything just shuts down. And it's Definitely that moment where all you really hope when you're Skyping into a bookstore or something is the moment that you freeze, you won't be going... <laughs> <laughs> you know. Okay, I gave testimony in a divorce case in Toronto over a Google Hangout from Perth, Australia, at six in the morning, Perth time. I had forgotten I was gonna do this, so I was in my nightgown. <laughs> so I was in my nightgown on a Google Hangout, swearing that I was telling the truth. <laughs> and um, my husband, who also had to give a, a testimony at the same case, had to go into the bathroom so he couldn't hear what I was saying. <laughs> Anyway, this is the world we now live in, but we didn't live in that world in 2004. And things were so clunky then that the first long pen we, things we did, you had to have a room full of big boxes of equipment. And you also had to have a video camera attached, you know, separately from the computer. And all of these other quite clunky things. But now, of course, everything shrinks once you start doing tech. And now you can do this on your phone or on your tablet. We used to have to use something called 
a Wacom enabled HP flip computer. Remember those? I, you sent me one. I did, I, I yes, did one of those we mysterious doing. things mere, of yours. At a mere moments time. ago, we yes. were doing that. Uh, but now we can use the tablet with the thing that you can write with on it. And uh, everything has therefore become quite miniaturized, and this is, what, uh, this is what has made it much more feasible. Anyway, that's enough about it. It's, so, it's, it's, it's out there in the world running around or signing around on its, on its own. So I was sitting backstage before we went on with Lev, and I said, you know, one of the things that I'm planning to ask Margaret about is how incredibly prescient um, The Handmaid's Tale turned out to be. Well, we don't have the outfits yet. <laughs> There's definitely the feeling that, I mean, I remember reading it in 1986 and thinking, this could never happen. We are, we are living in, it's 1986, look around. There are buses and high tech and how could this, uh, you know, I, and I read it absolutely as an allegory, as a metaphor, perhaps a warning in the sense of the 1984 or the Fahrenheit 451, but you're where you never actually expect to go. You're just sort of being, being warned off from this place. Now, it doesn't feel like it's that far away. Now it feels like it's a skip and a jump to there if a couple of things happened and a couple of people. Well, in a way. couple of states or several states in the United States of America, we're more than halfway there. Um, and in fact, the New York Times had quite a large piece about that several weeks ago, which when I, speaking of social media, retweeted it, <laughs> I was accused of fantasizing. Uh, so I just had to keep repeating the URL that led to the New York Times piece. Mm -hmm. uh, so women being arrested on suspicion of uh, being considering having an abortion. You know, they weren't considering, but that they were arrested on suspicion of considering it. So we are now in a world in those states where the, where the government purports to be able to read your mind. And, How and weird is that? I mean, to me, it sounds so much like the Salem witchcraft experience, uh, or even, um, or even uh, back in the days of the uh, Spanish Inquisition. You know, I'm, I, I know what you're thinking, Neil, and it's not a good thing. <laughs> so I'm going to arrest you and uh, lock you up so you won't do that thing. Yes, you could be arrested for having wrong thoughts. For having wrong thoughts. Actually, it reminds me quite a lot of when I was a summer camp counselor of little boys. You didn't know this. I had little seven-year-old boys under my control. <laughs> <laughs> Is that scary or what, Neil? <laughs> she discovered several years ago that she could absolutely terrify me. <laughs> well, I guess I... I, I channeled the witch out of The Wizard of Oz, which I didn't know that this was one of the things that uh, probably determined your life's career. Yeah. I, was, I was five years old at the cinema, and I fled under the seat. You fled under the when seat. When she was on. And, I mean, and, and back then, of course, you know, back when, when dinosaurs were still riding penny-farthing bicycles, um, <laughs> the great thing about going to the cinema was that she was huge. This was a, this was a, a 60 foot high screen. Green. And there was a giant green lady on it. Cackling. And, uh, cackling maniacally, and I knew I was doomed. Yes. Um, you know, nobody gets out of here alive. And that bit where, you know, Dorothy pours the water over her and defeats her, you're going, no. <laughs> Wouldn't happen. Wouldn't work. No. <laughs> Tried it She's on coming mom, for me, you work. throw the water, you have a wet, pissed off witch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, so I did frighten Neil uh, unintentionally. 
And I'm going to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) How about unintentionally followed by... So, (laughs) The Handmaid's Tale was... It was prescient, it was accurate. How much, at the time when you were writing it, did you feel you were extrapolating on stuff that was happening and, and stuff that was around in the early 80s, and how much were you just going, well, this is the kind of warning? No, it was already, it was already there. Um, but having been born in 1939, long before you, having been born long before you in 1939, and therefore having been a small child during World War II, and then uh, the Cold War, um, I've always been very interested in dictatorships. So it was partly an answer to the question that one sometimes asks oneself, which is, if a dictatorship were to appear in this country, what form would it take? And how would it get that way? Uh, So it was an interest in, in dictatorships and also an interest in George Orwell, whom I read Roughly at the time 1984 came out, I was just at the age to read it in paperback. In fact, I still have the paperback. Did it have a lurid cover? It had a lurid cover, yes, because paperbacks in those days did have lurid covers, and they sucked a lot of people into reading great literature that otherwise wouldn't have done it. I I love old, you know, late 40s, early 50s classic literature. In lurid covers. With lurid covers and with amazing taglines. Exactly. You know, she was the slave of his lust. Exactly. And, and it's Dickens. Yes. <laughs> um, Fair enough. And you're she, going, she was. In, 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 she was, actually. In, come to think of it. Yes. yes. Um, so, but not maybe in those words. Uh, so it did have a lurid cover. In fact, it had the, the female lead with a very plungy neckline and uh, a couple of men ogling her, and then in the background a sort of bald, uh, bare-armed, muscly guy who was obviously in the enforcer, eyeing them in a Cold War suspicious kind of domineering, dictatorial way. Uh, so I always wondered what one of those kinds of books would look like if it were told from a, the female protagonist's point of view instead of Winston Smith. So it was partly that interest, partly my interest in the American Puritans, not a democracy, by the way. It was a 17th century theocracy. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I sat it in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because that was the headquarters of the very same uh, American Puritan theocracy right there. I was was surprised when I learned that the original Puritans didn't leave for freedom of religion. No. They left in order to stop other people doing things they didn't like, to go to somewhere where they could actually... That's correct. Uh, They were very hard on the Quakers, for instance. They hanged some of them. Uh, The Quakers, of course, in those days were a more obstreperous bunch than they are today. (laughs) And they used to do things like taking off all their clothes and streaking the congregation of Puritans with uh, (laughs) carrying uh, uh, coals of fire and uh, pots on their heads. So it would put you off after that had happened a couple of times. Uh, So they did have, in fact, Longfellow has got three American narrative poems, and one of them is about that, it's about the Puritans. The best known one is The Courtship of Miles Standish, which is a sort of a romantic story. Uh, the second one is about the Salem witchcraft trials, and it's very interesting. And the third one is about the Puritans, and he couldn't figure out how to resolve it. So he just has somebody have a heart attack at the end, which kind of, you know, finishes it off. <laughs> it's the Puritans in, who are in charge, and the, the son of the head Puritan falls in love with the Quaker girl. They have a romance, so is she going to end up being hanged or not? So. Uh, then all, Oliver Cromwell dies. Uh, the governorship of, of the New England colonies is taken away from their control, bad. Uh, but the Quaker girl doesn't get hanged, good. So, so he was conflicted in, in those cirques. You have to have a heart attack for somebody, don't you think? 
there is that, that sort of, that, that point where you get toward the end of a story that has been going just fine, and then you go, oh, I have to finish this. Well, I don't think it was ever going fine for him because he didn't know whose side it was on, he was on. You know, should he be on the side of religious toleration? Well, that means the 18th century comes in and the New England colonies lose control of themselves. So it was sort of political control versus more open, um, a more open uh, and welcoming um, kind of society. And, and uh, America has been struggling with that ever since. <laughs> Don't you think? I do. Well, I think it's also part of, the, part of the folk tale of America. I remember when I first moved to America in about 92, um, about, I've been here about a year, and my son Mike came home from school and at the dinner table looked at me very nervously and he said, my teacher says you're a liar. <laughs> And I said, oh, really? Do, do tell. And he says, well, I told her the thing that you told us about how people was transported to America for stealing things and stuff. And she said that wasn't true. And the only people who came to America were seeking freedom. No. Oh, OK. And I said, that's very interesting. And realized that there was this glorious folk tale that they were believing that actually had nothing to do with how their country was started and what was going well, on and how it was Well, considered in the long view. <laughs> you might say they were seeking freedom. Well, they were way. definitely seeking not to be hanged, which was... <laughs> well, that's a form of freedom. Which is a form of freedom. Yes, I think so. Yes. Yes, anyway, I'm sure you've read Ma Flanders. Yes. She gets transported and then becomes quite rich. There was, um, I, I, I wound up reading the, buying myself a set of the Newgate Chronicles, um, which is rather wonderful because it's everything that you could get into trouble for. There were a lot of things. There were. There were also a sliding scale, uh, particularly when it came to transporting people to Australia. They transport a lot of men for things like bashing people over the head and you know, breaking and entering and uh, manslaughter and things like that. Uh, and then they had all those men there and they were quite obstreperous. And they decided they needed some women. But there weren't a lot of women who went around bashing people over the head and breaking and entering and manslaughter. So they had to have different things for them. So you could get transported for coughing, you know. <laughs> it's a, a spool of thread. You know, the, the bar was quite a lot lower if you were a woman, because, because they women to, weren't going to do the same kind of crimes. No, they that needed to balance out the numbers. Think of that. No, that, don't think of it too much. It was what was quite actually, unpleasant. Bizarrely, that, that actually makes sense of a few of the weirder crimes that I've run into that carried death penalties that would get commuted. Because, of course, one of the things about um, being transported was you were basically given a death penalty, but it wasn't a death penalty. You were transported yes. for life. Um, and at the point where I discovered that living with gypsies for a month was that carried a, a death penalty. Did I was it? Going, there is what if you were a gypsy? No, I think you were fine if you were you a were gypsy. You were all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just living with them. Just living for with a them month. For a month. You're so going, you, can, you can see somebody going, no, it's been 29 days. <laughs> you cannot kill me. <laughs> uh, That's amazing. Maybe, we, do you think we should talk about writing? Yes, yes. let's. <laughs> Although, although, actually, I should point out that what we are doing up on this stage, um, completely forgetting that you lot were here for a minute, um, was the thing that writers actually do when they get together, which is... What they, they really do is talk about car insurance. <laughs> we have never talked about car insurance. That's what because we do is, neither what... of us can drive. <laughs> I can drive, just not very well. Um, <laughs> What we do is we say, by the way, did you know? And you wind up trading glorious pieces of information. Um, it's that, that sort of point where you sort of go, well, I've got, I've got one here. And you, you, you thrust your piece of information across the table and wait for another piece to come back. 
because writers, we are magpies. We are That's jackals. very true, yes. Now, the kinds of pieces of information that you collect, on the other hand, Neil, tend to be slightly on the weird side of things. This I actually have not met anybody else who's delved very deeply into the Newgate Chronicles. <sighs> <laughs> Why would anybody not read the Newgate Chronicles? Well, now that they I know the, that they exist. They're, they're they great. There's about five like volumes, um, and they are just... Um, there are, I think there are different editions of them, but, and they do get a bit repetitive. Yes, it does. Um, I, I read a, a sort of a short version which was called Hanging in Norwich. So it was all the people who had got hanged in Norwich from about uh, 1500 and what they had got hanged for. And it does get a bit repetitive after a while. The fun, th the fun thing about the Newgate Chronicles is there are people who get off and who don't do it. And then you get some story, you know, Moll Flanders is more or less there's at least one case in the Newgate Chronicles where I was reading, hang on, this is incredibly familiar, and realizing it was. When did you realize you were gonna be a writer? There are two origin stories about that. <laughs> one was told by my, my aunts, both of whom are dead now, so we can't really uh, contradict them. And they said that I announced this when I was six. I have no memory of having done that. Uh, but then that thought didn't stick with me because then I wanted to be a painter. And I wanted to be a painter for a while and then I wanted to be a fashion designer. And then reality set in and I read the guidance handbook in high school of 1951. And that had a lot of professions for boys and it had five for girls and they were secretary, nurse, uh, public school teacher, airline stewardess, which is what they were called then, and home economist. <laughs> that was it. So I didn't actually want to be any of those things. But being a mercenary child, I looked at the salaries for all of them, and the home economists made the most. So I decided that I would do that. And that is why I didn't take typing. A big mistake. I should have taken it. Yes, it's called secretarial sciences. <laughs> typing and shorthand. Uh, so I took the home economics instead. So the cake piece, thank you for the cake piece. It spoke to me. Uh, I was a very good cake decorator. And I appreciate cake decoration of a superior kind whenever I see it. But I'm a very poor typist and uh, no good at spelling. But I can, pr problem with your zipper of, of a you clothing could, kind? Of a clothing I can kind. fix that. <laughs> I can I, fix that for you. I loved because they were just so incredibly sensible and practical. One article I read by you on, or just quote from you on writing and how to be a writer and how to do it where you said if you're going to be a writer you need something to write on and you need pencils <laughs> and you need lots of pencils because one of them may break or you yes. might lose it this is especially true on airplanes and but the one of the best things you can read on writing is as you and i know is chuck wendig's blog when he is in a mood to be writing about writing and not about his two-year-old child uh, so when he's doing the writing thing, uh, that saves a lot of people like me a lot of time because uh, other people say, can I be a writer? How can I be a writer? I'm having writer's block. And I say, well, just, just go to Chuck Wendig's Terrible Minds blog and all of the answers are there. There's a lot of swearing in it. So you just kind of strain that out, strain out, and you are left with the essence so if you want to be a writer, number one, write. You know, it's very straightforward. But the second origin story was, is mine, and that was when I was 16. And I wrote what I thought was a pretty snazzy poem uh, while crossing the football field uh, on my way home from school. 
wearing a pink princess line dress with a gold button, which I had sewed in my home economics class. <laughs> See, I have this very precisely pinpointed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I set it down to my high school English teacher, who was indeed legendary, and she was, I put her in one of my stories once she was dead, it's in a story called My Last Duchess, so I could use her real name. Her real name was Miss Bessie Billings, Miss Bessie B. Billings, and she did say, in point of fact, this must be a very good poem, dear, because I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes all it takes is somebody to say something like that, and the fans can, you actually can start there. So well, you wrote know, poetry. I, well, I wrote poetry. I, I was writing everything that I write now, I was writing then. And I think I probably went forward with it because I was completely ignorant of, about what it might involve. There weren't any writers, any visible writers in Canada at that time. We had dead writers from other countries in school. Uh, but some of them were female. So you could be dead and a writer and female and from another country. So that kind of opened the door, didn't it? <laughs> One of the things that I've, I've always admired about you is um, most of the writers I know are very content to do one thing. And you write mainstream fiction, speculative fiction, myths and weird stuff, academic <laughs> stuff, poetry, um, children's books, you've written screenplays, opera. Um, what have I missed so far? I know I've missed Sing, about... Singing commercials. Singing com you've written singing commercials or you've sung in commercials? Both. <laughs> Did you sing in your level. own commercials? Once yes, that you I had sang written? in my own commercials as well. What were you advertising? The reindeer romp in <laughs> 1956. Yes, singing commercials. Uh, but you do all of these things too. You do lots of things. You do comic books. You do, um, I think you do screen, the odd screenplay. Uh, children's that, books and, and adult fiction. But that's, I, I think that's one reason, you know, I don't have many role models, um, and, and which is one reason why you get to be one of my role models, because oh. I go, look, she can do it. She's yes. allowed. Well, nobody told me not to because I'm so old, Neil. You were Neil, so, I'm you so were very, so very, very then. old. Yes, but there weren't any creative writing classes. Ah. So nobody said, are you in the poetry class or are you in the fiction class? Because you have to choose. So nobody said you, could, you had to be one or the other. Instead, they said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you want to be what? Nobody's that. Uh, you can't be that. But they didn't say you had to be this or that, and they didn't say you couldn't be a girl. They just thought the whole thing was so weird that they tried to discourage me as best they could. Um, so when, when did you start making money from writing? Not for a while. Uh, little bits of money, but if you mean enough to live on. Yeah. Okay, so little bits of money. And in Canada in those days, it was very, very long ago. <laughs> long, long time ago. A uh, long time ago, there was a radio program run by a guy called Robert Weaver, and that's who first started publishing Alice Munro, and first started publishing just about everybody in my generation in Canada, and they paid you little bits of money to have your thing on the radio. Mind you, they would hire actors to read it, and they were always a bit breathy and uh, over, overly dramatic. But nonetheless, there it was on the, on the radio, and you got a little check, and that was extremely invigorating. Um, but making money enough so that you didn't have to have a full-time day job, I think that probably took 16 years. What point, what point did you know that you were a writer? That couldn't have been origin story walking across that. There must have been I'm, a point I'm sorry, you... but it was. That yeah, as I said, I, I was very ignorant. 
I, I didn't realize that you had to do all of these other things. And uh, my agent, who is sitting right in this room right now, is called Phoebe Larmore. Uh, I had a publisher from my first novel here, and it was Atlantic Monthly Press, and his name was Peter Davidson, and he phoned me up and he said, you need an agent, and I said, what? Because I was Canadian. We didn't, Canada's really big, but we didn't have agents. <laughs> Nobody had an agent. Uh, he said, well, yes, you really do need a literary agent. And I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. I, I said, no, I don't, and this went on for a while. And then he said, well, if you ever do need one, do I have an agent for you? And at the very same time, she was reading my first novel and thinking, I would like to represent this person. And then I got into a film scenario with the first novel. Nobody in Canada knew anything about films at that time. They do now. Thank you, David Cronenberg. Um, <laughs> But at that time, just nobody knew even how to write the contract. So I realized I was in the middle of something that not, nobody knew anything about. So then I said, OK, I do need an agent. And so that's how that all happened. But that wasn't until 1971. So a long time of people thinking they didn't need agents and believing everything publishers told them. We are. We are. Authors are pathetically grateful to be published, in my experience. It is true. Up um, to a point, they are. But then if they do well, that gratitude kind of diminishes. It does. <laughs> After a while, it's like, yes. But then it comes Chaos. back. Then you think, actually, this has been pretty good. I think there's a middle, there's a middle period when you think other things. I, I just, these days, look at everything and um, I feel lucky. And I, I feel lucky, I even feel lucky to be alive and writing in this time when we can still feed ourselves by writing. I'm not sure that's gonna be true 20 years from now or not necessarily. I think it will still way. be true for some people. Uh, it may be true in other ways. Um, I think everything, as we all know, everything's shifting and moving under our feet and uh, people are learning uh, various other different ways of approaching the whole business of, of getting from tin can A to tin can B, which is how I think of tin can A as the writer, tin can B as the reader, everything in between is string. So it's the string that's changing. Yeah. And the fact that the string is changing is changing the A's and the B's to a certain extent, but you're still involved in getting uh, your thing that you have done across time and space to B, the unknown B. Because one of the true things about writing is it's not like being an opera singer in so many ways. You don't get the outfit either. It's true. Um, but you're not in the same room as the audience, ever. You are separated from them, and you don't know who they are. So the time capsule that you mentioned, you know, book in a box, sleeps for 100 years, that's just an extended version of what writing is anyway. You write the thing in time A, and then time passes unless you're writing online. Um, with everybody looking at it, which I'm not going to do. So, uh, and then time passes, and some, somewhere out there, if you're lucky, somebody is reading it. But you don't always know who that's going to be. In fact, you almost never know who it's going to be. So in 2114, round about your 175th birthday, when we will all be gathered here for you again, and your old lady voice is going to be truly frightening. And we're all going to look a bit different, we Neil. Will. <laughs> so that, at that point, a story that you have written will actually get unveiled. We you. don't even know if it's a story, because the stipulations about futurelibrary.no, which means Norway, not no, um, <laughs> futurelibrary.no, the stipulations are, number one, you can't tell anybody what's in the box. Mm -hmm. Number two, it can be anything you like. It can be a word, a poem, a story, a novel, nonfiction. But number three, no images. So you can't put pictures in. 
just words in a box, sealed up. Uh, all that we'll be showing is your name and the title of the thing that you've put in the box. And they will be in the room called the Future Library in Norway. And people will be able to go into the room and imagine what's in the boxes. And it'll be one writer a year for 100 years. So the committee choosing them will replace itself several times. The ones writing the final books haven't been born yet, nor have their parents. So it really is a letter to the future. And it's therefore a very hopeful project because we assume there will be a future with human beings in it. <laughs> we assume that they will be able to read. We'll, we assume that they will still wish to read. We'll, we will assume that the forest will grow. We assume that the future library will not be destroyed in a cataclysm. And we assume that, actually she assumed, the, the maker of the project called Katie Patterson put a printing press in the room just in case, <laughs> just in case there isn't one. Uh, so it's all together pretty hopeful. And the first thing I did was I sourced some archival paper because you wouldn't want them to open the box and find a couple of little yellowed oxidized shreds. That would be very disappointing. There is a moment when I will have to cross the border into Norway and they will say, what is in that box? And I will have to say, I cannot tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and they will say, we'll see about that. <laughs> and then, but I'm going to have strings and sealing wax on it. I'll allow them to put it through the x-ray machine, but I don't think they should be allowed to open it, do you? I just imagine these headlines, you know, famed author Margaret Atwood, now in her third year in prison in Norway. Holding on to her box. Holding on to my box. Defend it with my life. Yes, it's a, it's a very smart project. She's a clever person, Katie Patterson from Scotland, 32 years old. And that is very cheering to me. I love seeing smart young people, which has I. been why it's been so pleasant to have all of these smart young people here tonight doing things on the stage. I could have been their babysitter. Actually, I could have been the babysitter of their babysitter. <laughs> How many, how many 75th birthday parties, events, things have you had so far? Is this the last? Oh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, several. Uh, fewer than 10, but more than six. <laughs> they said to me backstage, they said, will you lead a chorus of happy birthday to you? And I said, no. You said no? I said no. I said, because she's had... Are you shy? Well... 75. Can you not sing, Neil? Absolutely, I can sing. You can it's 9.32. There are so many questions I would like to ask you, but technically we're out of time, so there is only time for one more thing. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday, dear Margaret. Happy birthday to you.